Hello and welcome to our March NHSR webinar on SHAPE, the Strategic Health Asset Planning and Evaluation Tool. My name is Gary Hudson and today we are pleased to be joined by Barbara Coyle, who is the Associate Director at Public Health England. Before I hand over to today's host, we would like to let you know about existing opportunities to get involved in the NHSR community. We run training courses regularly. Please check the upcoming webinars on our website. NHSR community is funding open source solutions that will help the NHS and public sector to take advantage of the huge benefits of all. Last but not least, do make sure to get in touch with us via various social media, write a blog, offer training or attend our book club. Today's webinar should run until 2 p.m. It's been recorded and will be later available on both our website and YouTube page, as will all the materials shared by the host. If you have any questions, please use the Teams live Q&A function and we'll, ask, we'll, ask, we'll answer these questions at the end of the webinar today. If you think of any questions after the webinar, please do, not, do feel free to contact us on either our Twitter page or via our popular Slack channel, both of which are shown on screen now and will be shared in the chat and a community member will be happy to help. At the end of the webinar, we'll use Mentimeter to gather feedback. The link will also be shared in the chat Please do let us know um, how you found the session. We appreciate your feedback. OK, so I'll hand over to you, Barbara. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for the invitation and this opportunity to talk to you guys about shape. I'm just showing my screen now and uh, hopefully you can see that. So shape, or to give it its proper name, is Strategic Health Asset Planning and Evaluation. It's a tool that's been around a number of years now. Um, I actually was part of a research team that started this back in 2004. And we had our first sort of shape user in 2006, uh, but it has gone through several different iterations and has adapted as, uh, as policy has, has changed. Um, but at its heart and at the core of shape, it's the same principle really how do we investigate and understand the needs and the demands of our services, of our uh, population, sorry, and do we have then the services in the right location given those needs and demands of our population? So to access SHAPE, um, it is freely accessible to anyone in the NHS or local authorities or in the voluntary sector, any, basically anyone working in the, the healthcare service. And to access, you just need to complete a user registration um, form. If you use your NHS email account, you'll be approved automatically. Um, so you shouldn't have any um, issues joining in. You don't need any special software. Um, it is just a, a web based application that you can uh, join into. So um, basically what I'm just going to cover today is a bit of a, a brief overview. Um, I'm hoping it will take about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Um, that will give you a chance to um, post some questions in the chat. And at the end of the session, I can pick those questions up. A couple of things to say. Um, so I'm the sort of shape program manager. I'm not the technical lead. So if you've got lots of technical questions, I might not be able to answer. Uh, but I will be able to hopefully demo all the key functionality uh, that the application has. Um, and I forgot to say I'm actually in OHID, which is the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities. Uh, formerly, um, we were in Public Health England uh, and SHAPE has moved with us into, into OHID. So I will um, jump in. So once you've got your username and password, you'll be able to access SHAPE and it will look like this. Uh, basically, there's three panels um, an information panel where you can pick uh, different uh, types of information you want to map, the map in the middle and in the right hand panel we've got um, where you can select different site types and services uh, to view as well as the interpretation of any of any data that you might look at. So I'll just uh, pick a few things so it's built around mainly ICS geographies um, that you can pick from a drop down list or you can select uh, by clicking on the map, so it's a fairly interactive map. Um, but you're not constrained by those boundaries, so um, you can look at an individual local authority or an individual CCG, uh, but you can also um, create your own groups uh, as well. So 
at the moment I've selected North Yorkshire CCG. And you'll see on this right hand panel now it's telling me I'm in Humber Coast and Vale is the ICS and these are its um, other organisations that are part of it. But if I want to add in another area from maybe a different ICS, I can just hit add and then that boundary will grow. And if I go all the way over here, I could add that one in too. And you'll see then the, the other ICS, the op ICS options um, still appear. If you want to pick, you can also move to local authorities and they are also um, able to be chosen as your sort of um, area of interest. I'm going to pick on Hull um, just because it's in my patch and it's a nice small um, area. Uh, don't get too distracted. So what are the essential things that you can do once you're in shape? Um, well, the starting point might be thinking about mapping the healthcare assets that you've got. So SHAPE comes preloaded with every GP practice, um, healthcare, pharmacy, hospital site, treatment centre, um, um, and some other sorts of data sets that we might have about care homes, for example. Um, so the SHAPE preloads all of these, and they all come from the organisational data service, which is now part of NHS Digital and they are the organisation that will assign unique codes to each site. And to view them on the map, you just sort of tick them and then they um, will appear on the map and using the different icons and colours to represent um, what they are. So you can just play with those and turn them on and off as you need. Um, the big circle seven there just means there are seven sites really close together. And um, so I need to click on that to zoom in and then I can see there's one there and actually there are six sites all operating out of that one location. So six different GP practices. And so it's just a bit like a Google map. You can zoom in and out depending on the, the view that works for you. Just turn that one up. Uh, recently, we've also just updated the site with the COVID vaccination sites and this is updated every week, whereas most of the other data from ODS we just update um, every month. So if there's been a, a change in a site opening or closing, it will only appear in shape at that monthly upload um, that ODS does. Sometimes ODS is a bit slow to update its um, data. Um, but unfortunately, we're kind of just constrained um, by that. But at any time that you think, well, I know now that that site's closed and um, when you scroll down a little bit, all the sites are listed and you can actually then just manually turn sites off if you don't want to see them on your map. So you've got a lot of control over the sorts of sites that you might want to see on the map or not. Uh, I quickly mentioned the, the, the COVID sites. This is a weekly data set that we get and it's from the Foundry. Um, so this should be quite um, up to date and we've got different vaccination centres, PCNs, pharmacies, including those that deliver certain services. I'll come back to that actually in a little bit more about what we can do. <clears throat> and similarly, another piece of work, um, we've recently just also mapped all the PCN or the primary care networks uh, across the country. If I, once I've selected GPs, I then have the options of identifying the primary care networks that are also in an area. And we just colour kind of colour coordinate the ones that are together in the, in the PCN, because as I'm sure you're aware, PCNs geographically can be uh, spread anywhere because it depends on the GP practices that make it up. But there's a sort of visual representation of the PCNs that we can get and I'll just turn, reselect them to, to turn them off. OK, so that's um, some things that we can do with sites. Uh, so that's one part of the, the puzzle that we're trying to to investigate. The other thing is about data and it's about populations. So in the indicators tab, we've got a number of indicators about the population. So we've got age profiles, we've got a population pyramid, we've got ethnicity, deprivation, 
and we've got some quaff scores, um, ethnicity, for example. So if you wanted to map, um, you know, where are my um, older population? Um, so if I click here in the 65 plus in my population pyramid, it will go away and map the lower super output areas that are inside Hull and tell and put them into quintiles, the, the different values of the LOSAs. And so if I actually, um, so this is the 65 to 69, so you now see the interpretation panel explains what it is you're seeing on the map and the key, as well as the data, the numerator and denominator and the link to the, the source of the data. You also get this sort of distribution chart, which is all the LOSAs uh, and the quintiles are actually based on the England distribution. Uh, but also if I alt click, I can select more than one um, age band and it will kind of re-aggregate. So now I'm looking at a map um, of uh, each LOSAs between the ages of 65 and 84. Uh, and again, the, the colours just build up. And you can also get this as a download. So there's a view data box that you can export uh, and paste that into wherever you need to paste it. And to get rid of that, you just hit undo and then it'll take you back to where you were. So that's how the sort of population pyramid works. Um, then there's another sort of format here. So these are our kind of spine charts where you can get the breadth of the values across um, all LOSAs in England. The little red will represent um, the, that mid, midpoint value for CCG. If I click on this, it just gives me a little narrative explaining the values. Um, shows an external indicator and that will actually go away and colour in all the CCGs across England um, on its value of that indicator. And the internal one will go away and colour in the LOSAs again inside the patch. So this is the index of multiple deprivation, um, which is an index metric. Um, and again, I've, I've picked Hull, um, which we know has high levels of deprivation. And you can see the majority of the LOSAs in Hull are in the, the most deprived um, quintile across England. Another little useful feature, you can untick um, the other key uh, metric or the key values that you're not interested in. Um, so then I'm left now with a picture of just those uh, lowest. I can just turn the key back on. That's deprivation. Um, Another one you might be interested in is the quaff recorded prevalence. Um, so if I pick COPD, this is a bit different. Quaff data isn't a geographical representation. Um, it is a GP practice value. So instead of colouring the LOSAs, we colour in the GP practice icon to show where um, it is. And again, I can do the same thing. I, I only want to find those GPs with the, the highest amount. I can untick the others then I'm left with this map of just those GPs. Turn them back on. And if I hover over it, you know, it will tell me as well um, who they are. So it might help me target or identify those practices um, that might have certain conditions that I'm trying to um, influence. And just hit the icon again and it will disappear. Uh, and another one that's all quite interesting is the ACON and wellbeing classifications. Um, this is from CACI and they have allowed us to map their data and shape um, for free. Um, but it comes with it's their wellbeing and their ACON categories. Um, this is when they take all the data from census and what you buy in Tesco's and try and um, identify and create groups and, and, and describe communities in a certain way. Um, and they've also got one now that's about well-being and whether or not the population is health challenged at risk. It's worth caution if it's healthy. And just say this is most definitely their definitions of the population, not ours. And if you want a link to their methodology and what 
things to say. We've, we've put all the data down there. At the moment, there was a note saying not for external publication uh, because it is their data. And you need to ask them if you're allowed to share it. You're allowed to use it and understand it. But if you wanted to put this into a chart or you know screen capture this into a report, you would need their permission uh, to do that. I think you might have noticed when I hover over the top, it will actually let me focus in on one particular LOSA and get that whole picture uh, of what's um, of how that LOSA is being uh, categorized. And again, to remove that, I just hit the acorn, the swirly button. So that's some of the kind of key indicators we have, uh, but we also have data that's on what we call layers. And basically these are just um, images that are across the whole country. Uh, they're not interactive as such, they're just sort of a, a, a picture uh, overlaid on, on a map and the sorts of things we've got there. Um, let's do the rural urban classification. So if you want to see um, how your um, LOSAs are classified according to that. Um, that's in there. And again, you can see it's the whole national picture gets coloured in. Um, one other one is about population projections. This is actually at lo local authority level, so it's much bigger. Um, we also have some environmental ones. So this is uh, nitrogen dioxide levels. Uh, risk of flooding from rivers and seas. So as you can see, you can build up these sort of pictures on your map. Uh, a little um, tip is, you know, say you're interested particularly in Hull and you want to lose all that other information. Further down, there is an option called map display options and you've got um, emphasise the air and I can lighten the outside. So that means my my picture is just uh, focusing on, on the one area that I'm in. And you'll notice sometimes some of the LOSAs have this little red line and that's just usually identifying if it's in the top 10% of the country. So as you can see, we've got a range of different um, mat or layers data that you can see there. Most recently, again, has gone in about unvaccinated uh, counts. And again, this comes from the foundry and we do update this on a, um, a weekly basis. So these are our unvaccinated aged over 40 who've not had their first dose. So again, it's helping you understand um, the, the location, the needs um, of those services together. So if I want to put unvaccinated and I, I can you know, compare them against the locations of services. So it's about how am I going to mobilise and use these two vaccination services to help pull in this population who are currently got one of the lowest um, vaccination rates. So that's a sort of a, a live case example of how shapes being used today uh, by our NHS and public health colleagues. Let's take those away. So the data, you know, comes in at all different um, times and the refreshes occur differently. So things like the vaccinations is weekly, but things like the, the environment is something that we've done as a one off upload. So actually like that risk of rivers and seas was back um, last year. So that's an annual data set. So each data set is a bit different. So there's not like one refresh that we do. Um, there could be different refreshes happening um, every day. Uh, but in the info panel, you will get an update on what data has been um, most recently updated uh, in shape. So lots of things, demographic, environment. Uh, we've got data about police crime, but that's only available in Yorkshire Humber patch. So each different area, you might see that you've got slightly different data available. That's because um, as well as offering this free version of shape, we do allow people to suggest and upload their own data. And um, there is a fee to do that. Um, but um, so we were doing a piece of work on um, cr crime and alcohol actually admissions. So we had a, pot, a little pot of money and we um, were able to upload the locations of all sort of um, 
alcohol licensing unit and alcohol related crime in the shape tool uh, to, to enable some or support some um, health needs assessments. But yeah, so that, you know, you won't see that those options available in every area. You know, if you're from the Midlands, for example, the southeast, that option won't appear when you log into shape. Uh, another interesting or useful feature is this um, ability to quickly highlight areas that are in the most deprived decile. So if you'd mapped other data like um, your rural poverty or loneliness or your population and you also just want to quickly overlay where are your areas of deprivation. You know, say you want to quickly see where you've got um, dentists um, and identify dentists that might be in areas of high deprivation. Um, you can use that um, to quickly, quickly find them. Um, I mean, we do have it, deprivation in both places um, just because it is a, a key indicator. And just to say that when I do map um, deprivation and a map the, these dentists, when I go back to the location file, if I scroll down, um, I can export this. So that little icon means I can export to Excel. So that will export me the list of my dentists and the score, the IND score, the population of where that um, where that sits. So that's quite a useful function, um, especially if you wanted to quick wanted to identify those dentists that are in the areas of high deprivation. Pop back here, um, and then you you can see uh, or order that sorry by the highest, um, and then export that function. Um, I'll just show you a few other things that we can do around um, primary care data and specifically GPs. So I'll just turn them on. Turn dentists on. And if I scroll a little bit down to um, attribute overlaying primary care, inside there, um, we've got a few quick flags that we can do and I we call them flags and that the kind of little maybe it's tags we should use. So if I quickly want to see what are the, the, the practices that have got more than 16,000 uh, registered populations, if I tick that box, which is with attribute overlay, it will minimise the map to only show me those sites or those GPs that have that particular category. And again, if I you can order this um, to see what they are and at any point export that. So we've got that for registered patients, the weighted populations and also um, IMD and recently patient survey. We're just trialing these at the moment. So this is a bit of an experimental data set that we're um, trying to investigate and um, more and more indicators will start appearing under here. Um, but a few things I can do it still. So if I want to do a bit more interrogation of the the GP data. If I select one and I just click on it, uh, it then tells me uh, that's the the name and the address of the practice. I can do some other things, so I can map its catchment or its registered um, population. So I tick that, and it will colour in um, all the LOSAs that have a patient who was registered to this GP practice. If I scroll in enough, I'll also get the value. So there were 527 patients from that LSA are registered to that GP practice. There is one person who lives here that is registered to that GP practice. So you can map those. Um, you can also you can map that both for an individual GP, but also at a PCN level as well. It will sort of add, add them all together. You can get the patient age profile with the population pyramid. And that's the registered practice as opposed to what I showed earlier, which was the resident population. I've got data about practice workforce. Um, so this tells me there is one a GP. And I can also look at number of nurses, direct patient care and admin. I've got dispensing activity. So these are what are the pharmacies that were mainly used by that GP practice? Um, so if I click the top 20, 
you can see that 28% of patients to this GP used um, Lloyd's Pharmacy, which is located there. So the purple are the, the pharmacies that are being used by that practice. And you've got a, a line chart that represents the, the weighting or the proportion. And we've got a few other bits and pieces. Uh, and then in the, it also will tell me who is, who else is in that primary care network for that GP practice. So this level of data is only available um, at for GPs. We don't have it for, for dentists or trusts, for example. It is just a GP data set that we have. But as mentioned, if I click then to PCNs, it will do all that same information, but this time it will do it for the for the for all the, the the PCN as a whole. So this is now the PCN workforce breakdown. And the population period for the PCN now. And again, it will map where everyone lives who is registered to a GP practice in that PCN. And as you can see, it's much, much bigger. Uh, and as expected, you'll get some strange one person who lives over here is registered to a GP practice. So you find all that information in focus panel. That basically means I've picked on one thing and I want to focus in on that. And that's why that comes up in that panel. Um, to just uh, unselect it, just click on it again and deselect. And then I'm back to my um, original place of just looking at GPs. So the last thing I sort of want to focus on is about the travel time functionality. Um, this, you know, with feedback from users, um, is that the one of the most useful aspects of Shape. Um, we've got about over twenty thousand users now across the country, uh, and I'd say this is definitely our our most used or most um, clicked on um, item. So again, if I do, let's do vaccination sites. So say these were the sites that were going to be used for the booster rollout. So I can map them. I can then do a travel time analysis. And this I've got options by distance, by walk time or distance cycling, car by distance or time. Now the general approach for vaccination sites has been within 10 miles. Um, so I'll click that one. Um, and you can see uh, it does a travel time analysis about how far I could get in 2k up to um, 10 miles. And if I deselect the options and, and just leave left with one, so this is 10 miles. OK, so this is really straightforward, but for Hull, as it's a relatively small area, um, I've got that they basically the whole of whole population of Hull um, have access to one of these vaccination sites within uh, a 10 mile car journey. The total population there, which is 420, that includes everyone out here. So there's people outside of the area that I'm interested in have access. So that's just what the difference between total and included population means. If I do included population, um, it will basically give me a little, um, again, the population pyramid of who has access. But um, Let's pretend because that's obviously not showing up too much. If we did uh, let's do public transport instead, that might show us a little bit more variation. So say the access standard was who has access to a site within a 15 minute public transport. Um, I can see now that my total population of Hull who do have access is 247,000. This is the population pyramid. This is their IMD score. Uh, but again, importantly, who's excluded? Um, and here I can identify there are roughly 11,000 people who don't have access to these vaccination sites um, within a 50 minute public transport. Uh, and again, I can have an understanding the breakdown of IMD for that. So I've just scrolled out too far. 
Uh, and just a little bit of explanation of what's happening here technically. Um, as I'm sure you'll be interested in how we calculated the travel time. So we use a, a piece of software that's developed by a German company, uh, Targomo. And for the uh, public transport, they have a comprehensive database based on timetables that are the web scrape. Um, how far you can get and estimate the times um, that you should be able to access those. So it is based on everything working as it should be, as it is signposted and timetable to work. So it doesn't, this won't work if um, um, something's down, for example. So it is what should happen. The travel time, it is based on the known average speeds um, and what people can realistically travel. So it's, it's fairly accurate for London, but pretty, um, uh, accurate for outside London and most of the times all match Google times for example. But so what we're doing um, is identifying to then be able to bring back data about the population who live in a travel time. We allocate it and we line it to the, um, the, the centroid of the LOSA. So each lower superalp area has a population centroid where it says the majority of the people live in this patch. So for our algorithm, if the centroid is inside the travel time, i.e. inside the green, this light green, then bring back the data for that LOSA. So, and I'll just, I can show you, I do have the um, LOSA boundaries here. You can see how they overlap. So that centroid um, is inside, it's a little dot, is inside my travel catchments. So that means I bring back the value for that whole LOSA, even though some of the LOSA isn't in my catchment or isn't uh, technically available in the drive time. Um, so we sometimes overestimate an area, but it means then we, un we might be underestimating in another. So actually, if I scroll in a little bit more here, you can see that that population centroid isn't in my travel time. Therefore, I don't bring that value back into my calculations, even though some of its people who live in the essay are within the 50 minute potential catchment of that travel time. So here I've you know, I've missed some people, but here I've included some people. Um, so, but we pretty much think it gets there in the end. Um, I would just recommend you don't take those values exactly as 939 and I tend to round up to the nearest thousand and we'll talk about there are you know 248,000 people who are likely to have access to that service. I'm just going to that again. And so that data um, can also be exported and, and that's the other benefit. Um, sorry if I click travel time again. Just I'm only do the 30 minute drive time. So if I hit export. Again, I've got this little icon that will export the data and this is exporting each LOSA that is inside that catchment or um, inside the, the travel time that I've created. So it's telling me there are 166 LOSAs that are within 30 minutes of car from those um, locations. And I can get that as a download. It automatically pops out with the IMD decile and the population. So the benefit of that export is that you can then link it to your own data sets. You know, so say you've got data about um, how many people are homeless by LOSA and you want to know how many homeless people have got access to a vaccination site where well, you can run the travel time analysis, get those LOSAs who are in the catchment and then link that to your data about LOSA and then about homelessness. And then you'll have that figure and you'll be able to say, right, um, you know, half of our homeless people are do have access um, or can walk walking distance um, to a vaccination site. Yes, yeah, so there's lots of opportunities that you can do with that data export. Um, we don't have an API 
on shape. Um, this is something that we have been asked for, but it, it's a bit tricky. Um, we don't really have the money to build it in now. Um, we have we use an external supplier uh, for shape. It's not actually inbuilt by um, OHID. We commission it out. So they've also got a lot of propriety software that we can't just share. Um, but we are trying where we can by making data available and downloadable into Excel um, that you can then use and put into your own data as you need. Um, so one other thing about the travel times, I'll just zoom in a bit more. So say you'd done your analysis and you were trying to, you know, you, you'd looked at your um, population, and you've identified where the um, 65 to 80 year olds are and you know that they're going to need a booster uh, and say that they were here, but there's no obvious um, vaccination service in that spot. Uh, one thing you could do is we've got uh, drag a marker and you can pop that in and then that can be added to your travel time analysis. So then look at the impact. Well, if I put a service there, what does it do to the number of people who have access to my service? Um, and I can have as many multiple sites as I like. So this is a really useful functionality. You could use it for anything. It could be um, about where you're going to put um, breast screening mobile units. You know, for, you know where is the best place to put those? Where is the highest number of women with the highest number of um, age that we're looking for? Um, if I put them in that location, do they actually have access? Is the travel is there public transport that will get them there? Is there a road network that will get them there if we expect them to drive? Um, so there's lots of um, functionality that you can use uh, with with that. And at any point when you've done some analysis and say you've added in lots of new sites that you're interested in, uh, I don't know if you've, you wouldn't have noticed, but every time I kind of put something in, the URL grows. Um, and this is our way of allowing you to save what you've worked on. So there's no kind of... Um, you know, my version of shape where maybe, you know, you could just store all the th key analysis that you've already done. Um, we haven't been able to build that in, but if you copy this URL, paste it along with your analysis or the map that you've done, at any time if you repost that URL, it will take you back to, to that particular analysis or piece of work that you've um, visualised um, on the map. Um, so that's uh, what we're doing to try and help people um, make use of it. So I think that's the key things that I wanted to show you today. Um, there are lots of other videos on shape out there. We've all done an NHS huddle um, about PCNs. Um, it's recently been updated to so support pharmaceutical needs assessment. So there's a webinar already out there on that. Um, there's lots of videos just generally about how to use shape um, on various sites and YouTube. Um, but hopefully that's given you a good overview of what you can use shape for now. Um, and I'll leave that there and can take questions. Thanks, Barbara. There's a number of questions that have come in. So one from Joanna is, is it possible to map all the CCGs in one go and produce a summary in downloadable format? Um, we can get, you know, the map um, is uh, CCG boundaries. Yeah. Um, so that's there and some your site data doesn't really make sense to being at um, just turn that off. Doesn't really make sense because it will just get it look really messy because there's going to be thousands of sites. Um, some data, you know, you can get at national level. So my a lot of my images, um, yeah, for example, that doesn't work because it's too much information. Everything just comes out brown. So it depends on the indicator mm -hmm. <laughs> is the answer. So it will be a bit variable. OK, great. Thanks for that. Um, another question that's coming in. What would you say are the main pros of using Shape over CDRC's Map Maker, which has apparently similar functionality? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that one. Um, all I'd say for Shape is that um, 
the map maker sounds like it's something that you manipulate yourself and that maybe you can put your own data into. Um, that's not shape. Shape is something that um, we've built to tell a story rather than yeah. it's not a GIS tool. It's not for you to put your data in and do what you like. Shape's oh. been preloaded with what we think are the key things. So most of the shape users are not analysts or GIS experts. Shape users are decision makers, practitioners, you know, people who need to understand the impact of their decision making quite quickly. Um, so that's a bit of a difference. It's not, I wouldn't call it necessarily an analyst tool. Yeah. Um, I think it's there more for the, the users, decision makers. Um, and I think that might be the distinction with the with the other tool. Sure. Thank you. That's great. That answers that question. Another question that's come in. Hi, Barbara. Thanks. This looks like an amazing tool. How much of the underlying data are available for download to do more in-depth analysis? Are there any conditions on the use of the downloaded data? So no, anything that you can download, you can download and you're absolutely free to do what you like with it because it's actually all publicly available data. Sure. Um, the only one that's different is that ACORN data set that I mentioned. That one, you can't get a download and you need CAACI's permission to to get the download and they will usually give it to you, but they need to make sure you're part of their agreement. Um, but yeah, we, that's the only one that we lay any restrictions on. The other thing that we ask is that people, if they're taking SNPs, you know, and putting them into pr um, presentations, uh, that you keep the, the, um, the Crown copyright statement, just so people know it, um, that we have the permissions to, to use the map. Sure. Brilliant, thank you. That answers that question. Another question um, is how you sign up to use this tool. Uh, someone's posted, it's not really a question, it's more of an observation. I can't find the sign up option on the app shape atlas.net slash place. OK, so that's the home page. And there's an option here called register for access. Excellent. And if you complete the user registration form, shall I um, post this in the chat? Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll send that out with the uh, with the kind of instructions into and also put it into the the YouTube link as well when it goes on on their live. Okay, excellent. So. Thank you. So there's a one final question um, before we then close up. Hi, Barbara. This has been a really interesting. Thank you. You mentioned care home data is included in shape. Is any other adult social care data used? And if not, are there any plans uh, going forward acknowledging that most AC, ASC national data is collected in aggregate format at local authority level, so not necessarily compatible with the tool that dribbles down to the extent of shape? Thank you. So I think the, the premise of that question is, is there plans for adding more adult social care data? Um, there aren't any plans at the moment. Um, it's the sort of thing, um, obviously there's loads of things it potentially could do and we try and get a list of requests um, and usually people email us at the help desk or there's a get to help um, box here from the, that you can talk to the, talk to us directly. So we kind of have got a list of things that, that users want to see and new developments and new data and when then we prioritise those and then they're the ones that we go away and find the data for. Um, so to be honest, social care hasn't come up as a as an option or as a particular need Excellent. for us to, to investigate. Yeah. Excellent. Actually, there's are two more questions before I let you go, Barbara, that have just uh, popped in. So uh, another one would would be it's more of an observation. So thank you, Barbara. This is a great tool. They're already using it on a project. But there's so much more it can do, which is an observation. The next question is how would you recommend exporting the image data from this tool? to keep it at high res as possible. Would this be using the print to PDF function? Thank you. Yes, so we, we do have a print to PDF function, which is this little icon here. Um, I use the SNP tool. Um, <laughs> that works for me. So I just usually take a SNP and paste it and that's usually been OK. Uh, I have quite a big screen though, um, with quite good resolutions, I guess. Um, there are little things you can do, like um, making it full screen. Um, you can hide um, 
some of the panels if you want to make your screen uh, a bit better. Um, but yeah, that's all I do, to be honest. Excellent, thank you. And there was one last thing I, I believe you mentioned around um, the ability to upload your own data into the platform for a nominal fee. I mean, who who do you need to contact to 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 get that arranged? Yeah, so just contact the, the Shape Help Desk uh, or myself directly. Um, our details are all on there, help at shape.atlas.net. Um, and our kind of rough fee, our minimum fee is about £500. And for that, you could get, um, you know, a couple of indicators uploaded, or it could be bespoke sites that you want uploaded. Um, a lot of people quite like having their own localities. Um, so we, we can put little flags on there. So this is an example of one that we've done. If people want to identify different patches. Um, so yeah, so we've got lots of um, ability. So our some of our commissions go from like £500 up to, um, we're working with community health partnerships at the moment on a £175,000 um, programme, which is to map all primary care assets and the state of the estate. Um, so we do do quite big commissions where people get their own bespoke version of shape and can do what they like with it. Uh, for example, Leeds County Council, they have their own bespoke version of shape, so does Kent, and they use it a lot for environmental planning. Uh, they used it a lot for about immunizations, rollout, flu and COVID. Um, so yeah, you can have a lot of very uh, you know, basically any data that you have that you want Matt, you can um, have a, a, a bespoke commission. But yeah. Excellent. That's great. Thanks so much for your time for presenting today, Barbara. I'm just going to close up the session now. If you can just shop, stop sharing your screen oh, yeah. um, and then I'll watch it. But thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. And what a great tool. There you go. Thank you. Ah, OK, it won't let me actually share my. There we go. <laughs> yes. So I'm having a few technical issues here, just not a second. OK, I'll, I'll close out anyway. I can't, I can't seem to be able to uh, share the screen at this stage. It won't let me do it. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for presenting, Barbara. So our next webinar is the 20th of April, and that webinar is entitled Approaches to Teaching R. Uh, we've got a couple of workshops coming up in 2022 as well. So one of those is the introduction to interactive plotting with R. That's on the 7th of April, so get your name down for that. Uh, the next one is intro to R, which is on Wednesday, the 27th of April, uh, 2022. And keep an eye out on our website for more workshops that we'll announce shortly. But yeah, just thank again. Thanks, Barbara, for uh, presenting today. And we'll see you at the next webinar on the uh, 20th of April. Okay, thank you.